Hi everyone, my name is Melissa. I am from Inspire Me ASAP. And today I'm here to talk to you about my um, six top tips for implementing guided reading at the beginning of a new school year in your primary classroom. And I want to begin today by sharing with you a story that um, takes me back 14 years in my teaching career. Sounds like a long time. Um, but it really sets the purpose and sets the tone for why I'm doing this presentation with you for you today. Um, 14 years ago, I interviewed for my first first grade teaching position, and I vividly remember the principal asking me the question, so Melissa, what is guided reading? And I stared at the principal and the other people that were there in the interview, and I kind of had that deer in the headlights look because I did not know what guided reading was. Um, I certainly did not learn about that in my student teaching. I did not learn about that in my college classes. Um, and I had no idea what to say to answer that question. So I kind of just stuttered my way through and babbled and I said something. Um, I knew I had no idea though deep down what guided reading was or even how to implement it for that first grade classroom. Um, Lo and behold, I did actually end up getting that position. It probably had something to do with my answers um, to the classroom management questions and other questions that had nothing to do with guided reading. But I did get the position, and you better believe that that first year of my teaching career, I was pretty much shadowed and followed by the instructional coach slash reading specialist. She was my savior that year. She helped me not only implement guided reading, but she really did help me understand how to implement guided reading successfully into my classroom. Um, it's one thing knowing what guided reading is, but then it's a whole nother thing being able to implement successfully into your classroom. So I am forever in depth to that, to that um, teacher who helped me with implementing guided reading. With that being said, I hope that that sets the tone um, for my presentation with you tonight. I'm hoping whether you're a teacher who is brand new right out of college like I was 14 years ago, or if you're a veteran teacher and you've been teaching for over 10 plus years, I'm hoping that after this short presentation, you're going to walk away with some knowledge um, that you didn't have before about how to implement guided reading into your primary classroom at the beginning of the new school year. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to dive right in. Um, the first step that I have for you is to assess your readers. And when you assess your readers, you are going to informally and formally assess your readers. Now in my district, we have a um, formal benchmark reading assessment and we use the Fountas and Pinnell benchmark assessment. There are several other um, benchmark assessments that you most likely have access to in your school district, such as the DRA or Rigby. Um, and if you don't have a formal benchmark assessment, you could certainly use reading uh, a running record and you could take a running record on um, books for your students. Um, so as you are assessing your student their instructional reading level that is the whole purpose of this assessment you want to know what is their instructional reading level which is the level that they can read with 90 to 96 percent accuracy with fluency with comprehension so the purpose of those benchmark assessments whether you use the Fountas and Pinnell benchmark assessment or whether you use some different formal benchmark assessment is to determine your students instructional reading level so that's the first step that you're going to do now once I use that formal benchmark assessment um, I also like to use different informal assessments with my students as well. And one example of that, um, I know it's going to be a tad bit hard to see, but one example of that is um, I will have links to all of these papers that I'm showing you um, after I'm doing the live video. I will have links to all of these. Um, but one example that I like to do is a reading interest survey. 
And the reading interest survey is something that I give to all of my students at the beginning of the school year. And the main goal is I want to find out how do they think, how do they feel about reading? Do they love it? Do they hate it? I want them to be honest with me. I want to know what type of readers I am working with. So I want to informally assess their attitudes, thoughts, and feelings about reading. So some of the questions that my students fill out on this survey would be, for example, what kind of books do you like to read? So they circle any and all that apply, such as adventure, mystery, science fiction, chapter books. I pay very close attention to how many genres they highlight. Because if they're only highlighting one genre, that's just as important as them highlighting every single one of them. Do they really read that much? Or are they just you know, doing that because they think that that's what I want to see? Um, I encourage honest answers and honest feedback before I give this to my students. Some other question is how often do you read at home? Do you have anyone to read with you at home? Do you have any difficulty with some of these reading behaviors listed below? The students highlight if they have difficulty staying focused when they're reading, if they have difficulty daydreaming when they're reading, if they have difficulty liking the books that they read. Again, I encourage the students to be honest. They are not going to upset me. They are not going to make me mad. I want to know what type of readers I'm working with this year. On the back of the reading survey, there's some other questions such as, um, what do you want your teacher to help you with this school year? So that's a really powerful question. I really read carefully what my students write to that question. Uh, another question is, what is a reading goal that you have? A lot of my students say that they want to read at a higher level and they have no idea what that means, but they want to read at a higher level. Some students will be specific and say, I want to start to read chapter books. I'm only reading picture books right now. And there are some students that will literally say, I don't have a goal. So that is such important information for me to have to track the growth of my readers at the beginning of the year to the end of the year. Um, and then this is one of my favorite questions is, what emotions describe how you feel as you read? And nine times out of 10, my students will write, what do you think that they write? They write nothing because they, I have, their teachers, I, I haven't, their teachers haven't taught them that when they read, they think about what they're reading and they feel what during their reading, they feel sad, they feel happy, they feel excited about the plot, about the characters. So this is just one example of how I informally assess um, my readers and how, like I said before, that benchmark assessment, I formally assess them. Once I have that information and that data, then I can begin the second step for implementing guided reading into my primary classroom. So the second step would be to group your readers. Using that information that you gathered, you then begin to group your readers according to their instructional reading level. Now, it's important to note that for this video today, I'm just talking about the instructional reading levels. I'm not talking about grouping your students um, based on strategy work. I'm not talking about grouping your students based on they need help with the same reading behavior, such as staying focused or writing in their reader's notebook. Those are all very powerful ways to group your students. But to, for today's video, I'm focusing specifically on instructional um, leveled groups and a more traditional approach to grouping your students for guided reading. So with that being said, what I would do is I would take a class record form, and this is where I wrote down all of my students' levels, uh, levels and their reading of accuracy and their comprehension from that benchmark assessment. So I have a class record of how all my students did on that assessment. And from there, I go ahead and I, it doesn't have to be fancy, but I just on sticky notes, create different groups of um, guided, different guided reading groups based on their level. So you can look here um, and see that, for example, I have one group, Noah, Emma, Leah, Liam, and Olivia. I made up these names. These are not my actual students that I have in my classroom. They are um, made up names. 
Uh, but these students would be at a level L and M. That's how they tested on that benchmark assessment. So even though they're at two different levels, those levels are very close. I'm gonna keep them together in the same guided reading group to start the year. Now remember, these groups are flexible. They could be changing weekly, daily, certainly monthly, but for the focus of getting the guided reading up and going at the beginning of the year, I'm grouping them according to their level. My second group might look like this. Mason, Jackson, Sophia, Jacob, and Ava. Maybe they're all readers that are at a level N and a level O. Again, they're not all at the same level, but they are very similar levels. That would be a group of students that I would put together in a group. Another example might be William, Isabella, Ethan, Mia, and James. They all tested at a level O. So I'm gonna keep them together in that reading group. Another group might be students who are all at a level P and Q. Not the same exact level, but that's certainly okay. I can take those readers and read a book that's at a level Q with them. It's, I'm really not going to worry about them not being all at that exact same level. And then my last group of readers might be um, a group of readers at an R or an S. So again, very similar, close enough reading levels where I'm going to put them in the same reading group. Now this is something that I would keep in my reading binder. It is not something that I would display in front of the students and in my classroom. This is just really for my information. At no point do I want my students knowing necessarily what level anyone is at other than them knowing what level they are at. That's their business, and if they happen to find out what another student's level is, it's not because I'm posting it around the room and they're going to find out that Zoe's at an R and she's the highest level in the class. We want to focus on the books that these readers are reading. So one way that I display my guided reading groups in my classroom, and this is something that the students would see. So this would all be for my reference. This is something that the students would see. And this is an example of how I would create a guided reading group bulletin board. So similar to what I had in my guided reading notebook and my binder, I have that same data up here on the bulletin board. And I have, for example, four readers, Noah, Leah, um, Emma, and Olivia, they're all reading Judy Moody with me. And Judy Moody, in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I know that's a level L. I'm not going to really broadcast it anywhere, but in my mind, I have a very clear purpose of reading that book with that group of readers. Another group of readers could be reading The Chocolate Touch, for example. Another group of readers could be reading the Scholastic News article or um, some other article that I found, um, Time for Kids. It doesn't necessarily just have to be a chapter book or a um, picture book, a quick read. Maybe it's an article that I found. Um, another group could be reading Jake Drake with me. Uh, it's important to know that these names I wrote on sticky notes so that, like I said, I can re we remember to keep them flexible. I can very, e very easily take Mason and for whatever reason, whatever purpose I have for that day, for that guided reading group, I could take Mason and say, you know what, Mason, I'm going to have you join this group for today. And I can easily switch out those groups. They are not stagnant, staying in that same group for weeks and weeks or months or the whole year. They are flexible. Um, Read, guided reading groups. Um, another thing to notice is that I have, whoops, Mason's name fell right there. I have um, my picture here. And another thing that you can do, instead of putting the students' names on sticky notes, just as a fun little thing that I like to do in my classroom, you can take the student's picture and you can, we all have so many pictures after picture day of those little tiny pictures of our students, and you could just put their pictures right up there. And then they can, they just kind of, you know, that's fun, right, for them to see their picture. And same thing with the sticky notes and their name on the sticky note, you can just move them fluidly throughout groups. Um, just like I showed you with the sticky notes. Um, and then one last thing I want to highlight is that I have the title of the book is the focus on the sticky note. So this group is currently reading Jake Drake. 
And so when I call that group with me to the guided reading table, I could say, oh, Jackson, Sophia, Ava, Jacob, come read with me at the guided reading table. Or I could say, oh, boys and girls, my Jake Drake students, come on and read with me. And I love to do that. I love to do that because it's showing that the focus is on the books and you know the kids here oh wow that that's a good book i want to read that book oh what book are you guys reading the focus is on the books that they're reading not the levels that the kids are at um so this is one way that you can display your guided reading groups certainly you can do um so many other ways this is just what works for me in my classroom um so so far we talked about step one assessing your readers Step two, grouping your readers. And then moving on to step three. Once you have your readers assessed, and now that you have them grouped and you have a system going, you're then going to want to create a guided reading schedule. And the purpose of this is really to just have a visual plan of how often you're going to meet with each group. Now, based on your district, your district might say, um, you know what, we want you to meet every day with three guided reading groups. Your district might have, um, you know, something mandatory in place. I know my district did several years ago. We had to meet with three guided reading groups a day. We um, had administration coming in to make sure that we had anecdotal notes on each group. So it really does depend um, what, what you're comfortable with, um, but also what your, what your district is recommending for how often you do meet with your groups. One recommendation would um, certainly be to meet with your neediest group every day, to meet with um, your highest group of readers once a week and maybe provide them with an enrichment project when you're not working with them, and then um, meeting with all other groups possibly twice a week. So the next step would be to create and to put a plan in place to get a schedule going. And again, it, it, it all looks great on paper, but certainly assemblies come up and, you know, we can't control any of that. It always looks great on paper, but, you know, we do try our best to stick with that schedule and to stick with that plan. But the, but the best thing to remember is that we do have that plan in place. And once we have that plan, then that's going to help us go to um, one of our next steps, which is to plan your guided reading lessons. So, so far we talked about assessing your readers, grouping your readers, creating that guided reading schedule, and then planning your guided reading lessons would be next. So I am gonna share with you um, two wonderful, wonderful resources that I've um, found throughout my years to um, help me, uh, just a go-to resource for developing those guided reading lessons. So the lesson plans, what each group is going to do. The first one, the first recommendation that I would have for you, and these are just two examples. I know there's so many, but these are just two that I have that are certainly my favorites, is the Continuum of Literacy Learning by Fountas and Pinnell. And I love, love, love this book, um, especially for what it has in the back of the book. So in the back of the book, it has level by level, so level by level meaning level A all the way to instructional level Z. It has reading goals that you would um, assign or teach to those students at that reading level. So for example, I can flip to, if I had my group reading Judy Moody and they were an instructional level of L, I can flip through the book find level L and look for different um, characteristics that would be um, consistent with a book at that level. I could see an example of what it would look like if I open up a, a book at that level. Um, I'm not going to take the time to actually find a level L just as an FYI this is a level H. But then also it does give examples of thinking within the text, thinking beyond the text, and then thinking about the text. This is also something that I love to um, show to parents during parent-teacher conferences. Um, I like to highlight this example of what 
the characteristics of the reading behaviors of, chi of their child is according to what level they're at. So it's just a nice little um, information for the parents to have. Another great resource for you to use for gathering ideas for lessons for your guided reading groups is Jennifer Servallo's The Reading Strategies book. I cannot speak highly enough about Jennifer and all of her books, but especially this one. So this book is a little bit more flexible in the sense that you can certainly use it for reading workshop mini lessons, um, reading conferences even, independently working with the student, um, or for our purpose today, for guided reading lessons. And this book is broken up um, by 13 goals. And the first goal, for example, would be working with pre-emergent or emergent readers, so like reading levels A to Z. And an example of a goal might be let's see here, um, talk like the character. So the strategy would be teaching your students how would you talk like the character in your book that you're reading? It talks about prompts that you can give, and it, it also, on the right-hand side, tells the level of who this would be helpful for. So some of these might say, for example, Q and above. This is appropriate for levels P and above. This is appropriate for E and above. So this is a great way, and you certainly don't have to go in order from front to end. You can pick and choose where to start depending on these needs and what your students need and what you need to teach them at the level that they're at. So another phenomenal resource to, um, that I certainly use as a go-to for planning my guided reading lessons. Okay, so now we are moving on to step five. And step five is teaching your students about the expectations about a guided reading lesson. So if we think about what we do at the beginning of the year, we teach our students what to do when they have to sharpen their pencil, what to do during a fire drill, what to do, we all these, that's why we go home exhausted at this time of the year because we are constantly teaching the expectations about what to do. Well, if you think about it, something that we would do every day in our classroom, for example, guided reading, we have to actually teach that. We have to explicitly teach or model what it means to participate and to be in a guided reading group. Now, depending on what grade that you teach, you might already have um, your students coming to you with experience about what um, they, they did in prior years. It may be something that is quote unquote not correct or maybe they are thinking that a guided reading group is a round robin reading. Um, so this is a very important step not to skip because you do want your students to understand what the expectations are. And one way that I found, which is a um, fun, engaging way to teach the students how to understand those expectations, is to do an interactive Venn diagram. And so let me just kind of get this ready to show you. Now these are laminating, um, laminated already, so I'm hoping there's not going to be a glare. I'll try my best. Um, but what I'd like to do is have my students to create this interactive Venn diagram. I have all my students come to the carpet. So where we would meet for a read aloud or a reading workshop mini lesson, I have all my students come to the carpet and sit in a circle. And in the middle of the circle, I take two hula hoops. I take two hula hoops and I overlap them. And I have one category of that Venn diagram represent the students. I have another category of that Venn diagram that would represent, for example, the teacher. And then I would have another, the, in the middle where the two hula hoops uh, overlap, so the middle of the Venn diagram would represent both. So these would be expectations that both the teacher and the students would be expected to follow. 
And so once my students understand the Venn diagram, the different categories, I then pass out one sentence per student. And usually it works out that every student has a sentence to read. And on that card, the students, um, one, the student will stand up and read what it says. So for example, it is my job to independently and silently read the assigned section or chapter of the text. So I say, boys and girls, turn and talk to your neighbor. Think about whose job is this? Is it your job? Is it my job as the teacher? Or do we both do this in a guided reading lesson? They take a few moments to turn and talk, and then we talk, and then we share what the answer really would be. Oh, it is the students, the students, you, that's your job. You are going to read that book independently. Another example might be, it is my job to participate in a group discussion about the text. So that's a great one to think about. I would, again, have my students turn and talk. Who do you think, whose job do you think that would be to have a discussion with the group members about that book? Boys and girls, you're right. That would be something that would be your job. Let's put that in the category, in the correct category of our Venn diagram. And then just one more example would be, it's my job to write about what I'm thinking as I'm reading. So in my classroom, we do a lot of writing as we're reading. We use reader's notebooks, we use writing notebooks, but during the guided reading group, I have them use a reader's notebook. This would be the perfect opportunity for me to get a little blurb about that to the students. I'm not gonna go into a whole big lesson about it, but I would just short and sweet say, yes, boys and girls, you're right, that's your job. You're going to be writing down things as we're reading in a guided reading group. So that would, for example, be some examples of the expectations for students. We would then have um, some students read aloud some, some expectations that maybe the teacher would have. It's my job to teach the learning target or the purpose of the guided reading lesson. So again, I just give a short little blurb about how, yes, boys and girls, that's my job as a teacher. I'm going to tell you what that target's going to be, what the purpose of us reading for that day is going to be. Another example, it's my job to make sure that the other students in the class are on task. This is so important because you know how the kids are. They are so distracted or sometimes they want to tell you so-and-so is not reading. And you know what? Guess what, boys and girls? That's my job to worry about that. That's my responsibility during this guided reading time. I will make sure that all the readers are doing exactly what they need to do. You don't have to worry about that at all. Another example might be, it's my job to document or write about the growth of each reader. I don't want my students, when we're in a guided reading group, wondering or even worse, worrying about what the teacher is doing. If they're reading at the table and I'm listening in to a student and listening to them read, or I'm in my, my binder and I'm writing down some anecdotal records, I don't want them thinking, what is she writing? Is she writing something bad about me? I want them to rest assured that this is just my job. This is my job as your teacher during the guided reading group, and this is just what I do. I take notes about what a wonderful job you're doing during the reading lesson. Another example might be, it's my job to assess the child's understanding of what they read. And then moving on to that last category, I'm just gonna give a few examples of the expectations that would describe both the students and then the teacher as well. An example of that would be, it's my job to celebrate what a good reader I am. Well, of course, your teacher and the students, we're all gonna celebrate, everyone in the class. We're all great readers and we're all going to celebrate our love of reading and how good of readers that we are. So that's something, we put that in the middle of the Venn diagram, that's something that we're both going to do. It's my job to have all the necessary materials ready. Oh my goodness, that is both of our jobs. Just like you don't wanna to have to wait for me, I don't want to have to wait for you. The other kids in the group do not want to have to wait for you. This is the expectation that both of us are responsible for. So you can see how that's just one way to explicitly teach the expectations of what to do during a guided reading lesson. Um, one thing that I like to do is when we have the Venn diagram complete with all the different characteristics and responsibilities in the correct spot, I then like to take a picture of it. And I do a couple of things with that picture. 
I photocopy it and I have the students take that picture and put it in their reader's notebook. And if I have to have them refer back to it for something that, oh, I don't know, they need a friendly reminder about, I can just say, oh, flip back in your reader's notebook. Remember when we did that Venn diagram? Remember when we learned about the expectations? Let's see if we can work on and then pointing out whatever it is that they, that student needs a little bit of a gentle reminder um, doing. Um, or you can also take a picture of it and display it on an anchor chart or a piece of chart paper. You can put it next to your guided reading groups. I love to take pictures of things that we do in the classroom and post them, especially when the students are involved. It's a great way to just a, um, act as a nice visual reminder for the students. Okay, so, so far we've talked about assessing your readers, step two, grouping your readers, step three, creating that guided reading schedule. Step four, planning your guided reading lessons. Step five is what we just did, which was teaching your readers about that, um, about the group expectations for guided reading. And then last but not least, and this one is pretty short, is step six. Um, and step six is where you as the teacher are going to think about what do you want the students to do when they are not with you in a guided reading group. So obviously we could talk about this for a whole nother 30 minutes. This could be a whole nother video, but you really need to know and you really need to decide before you get your guided reading groups up and going, what is it that you want the rest of the students doing because you don't just want it a free for all. You want them doing authentic, meaningful work when they are not with you. They should, always, they should also probably know um, that the, that time is not a time where they could come up and bother you. So they really need to be self-sufficient when you are with your guided reading groups. They know not to bother you and not to disrupt you. Um, one suggestion that you might want to consider is using a reading workshop approach. Um, I use a reading workshop approach in my classroom to teach reading. And what that means is I begin my literacy block by um, a mini lesson, whole group. So all my students are together on the carpet and I will teach a whole group reading mini lesson. It could be on inferencing, it could be on something with the plot, it could be on something with characters and analyzing character actions, it could be any possible um, whole group mini lesson. I then give my students a job to do. They go to their seats and they start their independent reading time. Now during that time, that's when I have those guided reading groups. That's where I'm going to call maybe two groups that day and conference with some other students. Maybe I'm going to have one-on-one -on -one conferences with two of my students after my guided reading groups. Um, so I, when I'm when the other students are independently reading, I'm calling maybe two groups of students and I'm meeting with those students at the back table. So, so again, they really have to be self-sufficient when they are independently reading and know exactly what their job is. At the end of our reading workshop is closing and we all come together as a whole class again on the carpet and we review what we did as a, um, a class for the mini lesson and then those students who met with me in a group might want to share with their partner what they learned and it's a very quick closing. Now I'm not going to talk too much again about um, reading workshop because that is something that I I love, love, love talking about, and that could be our whole, uh, the, uh, a whole nother video, which it actually is going to be. Um, I actually plan to do another video in the upcoming week and focusing specifically on that topic, on reading workshop and how that is kind of an umbrella which guided reading would fall under. It's definitely different than guided reading. They're two different things, but it's something that I do to coincide with my reading workshop. Um, so in closing, um, a few more things that I just want to share. Um, if you are wondering, so that's it. That's all I have to do. All I have to do is follow those six, those six steps that she said. Well, no, as you know, there's always other things that, of course, you're going to want to do that's crop up and organizing everything for each group. Of course, there's going to be more. But I, do, I just wanted to share two other brief things that you might want to consider. Um, this, these certainly aren't necessary, but these are just things that I do think are important and that will help um, show the growth of your students throughout the school year. And one of those um, things that I 
would like to share with you is um, parent communication and communicating with your families about the data that you collected during the benchmark assessment. So going way back to that step one, when you determined what your students' reading levels were for that benchmark assessment, you might want to consider sending home some sort of note that explains to the parents um, what you did during that assessment, what the level of their child is, and what that level means, what type of books that they're reading, what you'll be doing in the classroom as a result of finding that information out. Um, an example of this, I'm just going to read a short little paragraph. At parent night, um, dear family, at parent night, I mentioned I'd be conducting a reading assessment of your child. The Fountas and Pinnell reading assessment determines your child's reading fluency, decoding, and comprehension of text at various reading levels. Your child's results of the reading assessment is on the attached page. This goes into much more in depth about um, what they can do at home and what that level means. But this is one thing that you might want to consider to send home and to keep those parents involved and keep them knowledgeable about the data that you're collecting about their child. And certainly you're going to have that information to share at conferences. And so if you sent this home at the beginning of the year, at conferences you can share with the parents, oh, guess what? Remember how I sent that letter home at the beginning of the year in September and your child was at instructional level L and they were reading Judy Moody books. Well, guess what? I have great news. Your child has really grown since then. Now your child is at, and we would use that as a celebration during that time. So that's just one more um, quick example. And then my other quick tip would be to somehow begin to think how you're going to organize all of this paperwork. So I had to kind of pull out all these things from my reading binder to go over the video. But you want to kind of think about how are you going to organize all of your anecdotal records? How are you going to organize all of the information that you're writing about specific students when you conference with them? How are you going to organize all that data about the, for example, how I showed you the class list and the record form of all your students' reading level from fall, winter, and spring? And so just one example that I have is in my reading binder. And my reading binder begins with um, a record of my reading workshop mini lessons, which again, that's my next Facebook session. So I just keep all of my mini lessons in there. And I know, I know that this is tiny and hard for you to see, and I'm just gonna go real quick. I will put links to all of this at the end of the session. Um, I then talk about, in, or I then have my next section about reading partnerships. I use reading partnerships in my classroom. And so I have that in my binder, organizing that information. I then have a section for my guided reading groups. So all these things that I kind of shared with you, I pulled from my binder. But this certainly would have um, just some additional information. I would have um, my guided reading lesson plans. So keeping track of all those different groups and their lesson plans, I would keep in my binder as well. I'm hoping the glare is not too big as I share these with you. And then of course that anecdotal record part. So this is, this is, I don't want to overwhelm you by any means, but that's just something else you're going to want to keep in the back of your mind. And just think about how is it that you're going to put all that together. Maybe it's not a reading binder, but maybe it's a data binder. Maybe you have your students collecting a lot of that information, and they have their own binder where they're also documenting their growth. The main thing is that you want to be able to show how your students are growing from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So um, let's see. I just want to make sure that I covered everything. Um, the very last thing that I wanted to say, say, and I forgot to mention this at the beginning, was that this is a freebie, and I'll put the link for this um, when I'm done, but this is a My Reading Progress chart, and this is a freebie that I'll um, have on my blog. It's already on there, and this is something that when I'm doing that benchmark assessment for that step one, I'm collecting all that data, I'm collecting that information, I have my students graph where their reading level is in the fall. 
And then we pull this out of the reading folder and in the springtime, when we reassess them, we actually do fall, winter, spring. But in the springtime, we see where their instructional reading level is at. So again, we do the F and P assessment and we, we color in to show how many levels we improved. And this is something that I just do in a reading conference with them as I'm actually assessing them. Um, this is just a wonderful opportunity to one-on-one -on -one say, oh, guess what? Here's where you're at in the fall. A type of book that you'd be reading at a level L would be, for example, a Judy Moody or a Jay, Henry and Mudge. So I'm just using that assessment opportunity to have a quick little conference with the students as well. Okay, so to wrap up our session for today, it is my most sincere wish that you had something in this video that you got out. Whether you learned something, whether you were inspired by something, whether it had you had something that you remembered, like, oh my gosh, I have that in my classroom. I need to get that going. I'm hoping that you are walking away, whether you are a brand new teacher right out of college or whether you are a teacher who's been teaching for 10, 15, 20 years. I'm hoping you walk away with today. Um, with some sort of inspiration to get these guided reading groups up and going in your classroom. I know that I have not been answering any comments or I have not been viewing any questions that you might have had throughout the presentation. Um, I will do that as soon as I end this presentation. One of the things that I will be doing is making sure that I answer all those questions um, and definitely putting the links to those resources that I mentioned, um, especially the freebies. So that's gonna be part of what I'm doing to wrap up. And then also, um, if you are not already subscribing to receive live notifications for my Facebook Lives, please go ahead and do so. So then you can make sure to not miss any, especially for if you're interested in maybe reading workshop, which I have coming up, um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks here. And then last but not least, if you did enjoy something, please consider sharing this video with a teacher friend who's either a new teacher or a veteran teacher. And if you think it can help them out in any way, that's the most sincere compliment that you could give me. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Have a wonderful evening.